Hello, it's me again. Uh, last week we were looking at reflexes in the upper limb. So today we're gonna to look at oh, reflexes in the uh, lower limb. Um, we were looking at muscle stretch reflexes, tap a tendon, dunk, um, also known as deep tendon reflexes or myotatic reflexes. So we'll look at the two main reflexes that get tested in the lower limb and I'm going to chuck in a superficial reflex because it's fun to talk about. My job is not to teach you how to test these reflexes. My job is to teach you the anatomy of these reflexes so you can understand the results better. Now we've talked about these deep tendon, myotatic or muscle stretch receptor, uh, reflexes before. Um, in more detail. By the way, if you want to find any of my videos, just search YouTube for my name and whatever it is you're interested in. Apparently Google's kind of getting the hang of this whole search thing nowadays. Um, but what happens is, is you tap a tendon, stretch the muscle, the stretch receptors in the muscle um, detect that stretch, kind of their job, send those uh, afferent nerve fibers back to the spinal cord through a peripheral nerve and then the reflex is in the gray matter so the sensory stuff comes in here and then there's a monosynaptic reflex as in that sensory those sensory neurons synapse with motor neurons that then go out through the ventral horn back out through the peripheral nerve to the muscle, which tells the muscle to contract. It's very useful, it means we can, you know, it protects the muscle, um, it makes posture, standing around, kind of lots of autonomic things that we don't really want to use our higher centers for. These reflexes just kind of manage all of that. So that's the reflex. There's more to it than that, but as I said, that's for another video that, in, that I've already done. So I have a job is to think, okay, if we stretch that muscle, which peripheral nerve is involved and therefore which lower motor neurons, which level or levels of the spinal cord do those neurons go to? So what level of the spinal cord are we testing that that reflex is present in? And then likewise, the peripheral nerve coming back out to the muscle, it's usually the same one. Uh, but also, so if the lower motor neuron is the neuron that's coming out of the spinal cord and going to the muscle, the upper motor neuron goes from the cerebral cortex down through all those bits in there, down through the spinal cord to that level, and it has a dampening effect on that reflex. So by testing the reflex, we can we can see if it's a normal reflex, if the reflex is absent or weaker, reduced, or if it is enhanced, more vigorous, more powerful. And each of those things will tell us something different. And so they tell me, because this isn't something I do normally, because I'm just an anatomist. I just look at how the body's put together. But the, uh, my, my clinical colleagues tell me that the way to get good at this is to do it a lot. And then you get used to a normal reflex so when it's abnormal, it stands out, right? And it's not like a, an on-off thing. It's, a, you know, there are more subtleties, subtleties to it than that. All right, lower limb. Okay, I know I said I wasn't going to tell you how to do this. I haven't got a tendon hammer, so I'm not doing it properly. But, of course, it's always fun to illustrate, isn't it? This is the, um, probably the easiest one to... You see what I'm doing here? I know I'm wearing black trousers. It's not a great idea, is it? But uh, I could test this informally on myself by crossing my knee over my other knee. I'm very relaxed. I can feel my tibial tuberosity here, my patella here in between the two is the patella tendon. Sometimes it gets called a ligament. It's not a ligament, but it is kind of a, anyway, another argument for another day. So I've got my patella tendon. If I give that a nice firm tap, hey. Um, and what really, if I mean, what you're really looking for is is, is it this muscle here? This is the quadriceps muscle. So you tap the tendon and you want to see that this muscle or feel that this muscle is contracting and you may get extension of the knee joint as this muscle contracts. So 
we tap the patella tendon. The patella tendon is a continuation of the quadriceps muscle group. So you're stretching the quadriceps muscle. The quadriceps, so, okay, right. Yoink. So, left foot, there's the big toe. So left leg, lateral, medial, anterior. So here's the quadriceps muscle made up of those lovely big, four big parts, huge, great big muscle, has to lift our, lift our almost our entire body weight so it's big. So you tap the patella tendon, that stretches these muscle fibers. Uh, there, they send that stretch um, out through the femoral nerve and the femoral nerve runs back to the spinal cord at levels L2, L3 and L4. So the spinal reflex occurs at those levels. Uh, most textbooks report that the patella tendon reflex is largely testing the L4 level. You'll read different things. That reflex then runs from the L4 level of the spinal cord back out, back to the femoral nerve, which again runs to the anterior compartment and to this big muscle group here, causing the muscle to contract. And the, the role of most of um, quadriceps femoris is to extend the knee, as we saw. So, that means that if you do that test on a normal person, a normal healthy person where everything's walk, working, you get that patella tendon, that reflex response. The muscle contracts rapidly, briefly. Um, if the femoral nerve, say, if the femoral nerve had been completely severed, as worst case scenario, then that reflex would be absent because none of the sensory information would get from the muscle to the spinal cord. And even if it did, none of that motor information would get from the spinal cord to the muscle. So if you literally connect, cut the nerve going between the spinal cord and the muscle, there's no way that reflex can function, right? There's no way the muscle will contract as a result. Um, okay, so that's the obvious one. So then if you hadn't completely severed the nerve, but some of those neurons were affected by something and others weren't, then you might not have an absent reflex, but that reflex might be diminished a little bit, right? Because not as many nerves, not as many neurons are carrying as much information, right? So if you think about, so this, these are lower motor neurons that we're talking about running from the spinal cord through the peripheral nerve to the target structure. So, the, so a lower motor neuron disease, you know, demyelination of these neurons could cause a change to this reflex, right? Okay, so if we go back up to the spinal cord level, that reflex just does its thing, right? But as I suggested earlier, we have upper motor neurons running from our higher centers down to, down through the brain stem, down the spinal cord to the appropriate level where, there's, where they synapse with the lower motor neuron. And that's how we up here tell our muscles to move. But those upper motor neurons also have an inhibitory effect on that reflex. So that fairly strong reflex is actually being dampened by the higher centers through the upper motor neuron. So if those upper motor neurons no longer existed, that reflex would no longer be dampened. So it would be more powerful, faster, brisker, stronger. And if you grade this again, um, if some of those upper motor neurons are injured, but others are okay, then that reflex would change towards that brisker definition, but it might, not, might be somewhere in between the two. Do you see what I mean? So upper motor neuron disease, that's in the spinal cord or the higher centers, brisk reflex. Whereas the lower motor neuron, so the peripheral nerve, if that's been injured, absent reflex, reduced reflex. And um, it will get more complicated than that when you get into real people and real things are happening. But that's the important idea, okay? Patella tendon reflex, femoral nerve, L4. L2, L3, L4. The Achilles tendon reflex, again. So you would, you know, 
get all nice and relaxed and give a nice tap to the Achilles tendon. Now the Achilles tendon is the attachment of gastrocnemius, mm, lovely big belly of the calf here, and soleus muscles into the calcaneus. So what you're doing when you're tapping the Achilles tendon is you're stretching gastrocnemius and soleus. And most people will talk about this being a stretch of gastrocnemius. So these muscles are innervated by the tibial nerve. You tap the Achilles tendon, you stretch the muscle fibers in gastrocnemius, that sensory information travels through afferent nerves up the tibial nerve, which is going to become the sciatic nerve. And the sciatic nerve is going to um, go back into the lumbosacral plexus. But the level we're really testing here is the S1 uh, spinal cord level. So the sensory information goes into the spinal cord at levels L5, S1, S2, but predominantly S1 is the level that we're testing. So the sacral spinal cord level, right? Um, so the sensory information goes in, there's a monosynaptic reflex, triggers the motor stuff going out, which then goes out again through the sciatic nerve, becomes the tibial nerve. Uh, and then that, those fibers go to gastrocnemius, trigger it to contract, which means it shortens. So the foot plantar flexes. So you should see some plantar flexion standing on your toes. So the, the foot should go that away when you tap that. But of course, again, if you're doing a, a tendon reflex test, um, and you tap that, you should be looking for contraction or feeling maybe contraction of this muscle here as a response of tapping that tendon. So again, when you're testing this reflex, you're testing the lower motor neurons in the peripheral nerve, the tibial nerve, which is part of the sciatic nerve, and you're testing the spinal cord at the S1 level, and you're testing the upper motor neurons running between the higher centers of the brain and that S1 level of the spinal cord, those upper motor neurons, to see if they're all intact. So again, if the upper motor neurons are injured, then the reflex is likely to be brisk, more powerful than normal. If the lower motor neuron is injured, then the um, reflex is likely to be absent or maybe weakened. And those are the two main ones that get tested, but there's another fun one that I want to talk about because it's fun to talk about, even though I'm supposed to be marking exam papers and this should be a short video, but now I'm prattling on again. Um, the plantar reflex, which isn't a stretch receptor reflex, it's a superficial reflex, but it's, it's really cool. Okay, now the plantar reflex is a little bit further along. It's on the, the plantar surface of the foot, the sole of the foot. And, um, okay, you've got to imagine we've got skin on here. And I haven't got many things with skin on. But what you're, you're not really stretching or tapping any of these tendons or muscles here. But you take an, an implement and rub firmly but not painfully from the heel towards the ball of the toe, the big toe here. And what you're stimulating there is the S1 dermatome. So this is a, a superficial reflex you might read all sorts of things about this, but it's a superficial reflex and that sensory information is then carried back through plantar nerves, the tibial nerve again, which becomes the sciatic nerve and back to the spinal cord and the reflex occurs at levels L4, L5 and S1. But it's a slightly different reflex, isn't it? There's a little bit more to it. Forget that detail, but that sensory information comes in and then triggers motor fibers that are going to run out from those levels again. Repetition's good, right? Because uh, again, down through the sciatic nerve, tibial nerve, round to the plantar nerves, which causes contraction of the muscles on the sole of the foot, the short muscles that are going to the toes. Um, so it um, causes flexion of the toes, uh, flexion of the little toe, of the 
all the toes and the big toe. I wonder if it causes contraction of these guys up here, I don't know. But anyway, so that's your normal response. Um, it's not always easy to do. If you do it with someone like me who's ticklish, um, then there is voluntary withdrawal. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's difficult. You know, he's, he's put away, it's horrible. Um, but in babies, it's different. Those sensory nerves running into the spinal cord, they don't trigger the same nerves as they do in the adult. They trigger some motor nerves that run out, run down through the sciatic nerve, but instead of going to the tibial nerve, they, they trigger neuron, neurons that are running in the common fibular nerve, also known as the common peroneal nerve, that runs and divides, and those neurons go to the deep fibular nerve, which are in the anterior compartment. So the deep fibular nerve runs to the anterior compartment of the leg and runs to the, the dorsal surface of the foot. So that then innervates muscles that cause the, the toes to pull towards the shin. So particularly the great toe, the big toe, dorsiflexes or extends you might say the big toe pulls towards the shin and the other toes kind of fan out they abduct a little bit that's what happens in babies that's normal um, that is Babinski's sign so why does it disappear in adults how does it change well um, in adults it seems that with development of the the nervous system that reflex that causes the toes to lift up um, is, um, is changed to the adult form. So the reflex that if the skin is, is set in, if the skin is rubbed, causes the toes to, to lift up, that reflex is um, subdued by neurons coming from the higher centers, those upper motor neurons again. Um, so in the adult, uh, and in kiddies, usually, usually this happens by about one year of age, although, again, you might read different numbers. But certainly as kiddies get older, and in adults, that reflex where the toes lift up is suppressed, depressed, you get rid of it. And instead, when you rub the sole of the foot, the toes pull down, they, they flex, they plant a flex. So in babies, this seems to be a really prim a primitive withdrawal reflex, right? Withdrawing from a stimulus. Um, but in adult, as we grow and our nervous system changes, we overcome that. But you might see that Babinski's response in adults from that plantar reflex test. So what's going on there? Well, that's a strong indicator that the upper motor neurons that affect that reflex are no longer able to affect that reflex. So it's strongly indicative of an upper motor neuron problem. So what have we learned? We've learned that the patella tendon reflex tests um, the lower motor neurons in the femoral nerve. Um, it tests the spinal cord at level L4, and it tests the upper motor neurons running between the cerebral cortex and that L4 level. We've learned that the Achilles tendon reflex tests the lower motor neurons in the tibial nerve and the sciatic nerve and they test the spinal cord function at the S1 level and they're testing upper motor neuron function between the cerebral cortex and the S1 level and we've learned that the plantar reflex is not a deep tendon or muscle stretch reflex but it's a superficial reflex and that it is an indicator if with the plantar rubbing we see Babinski's sign the big toe lifting up in an adult that's a strong indicator of an upper motor neuron problem um, between the cerebral cortex and the S1 S2 levels all right and hopefully the structure helps you understand what those tests are for and what they're testing. It's a hard thing to learn and remember, but when it makes sense, it, uh, it makes sense, right? Not that any of that probably made sense, but whatever. Right, back to exam papers. Um, see you guys next week.